I think after the two super papers that we've had so far this morning, I'm reminded of the saying, after the Lord Mayor's procession, the dust cart. <laughs> At least lunch looms after this. I've got a subtitle for this paper, Tally's Blood and the Tyranny of Love. But the first thing to say today is that I pay tribute to the notes on Tally's Blood prepared by the late Charles Barron, uh, freely available online in an edition uh, produced by the former Learning and Teaching Scotland. I'm sure you're all familiar with them and will share with me the sense that Charles prepared clear and acute notes on the play. He addressed inter alia issues of play, structure, character, themes and the practicalities of production. Um, just as one would expect from an experienced playwright, director, teacher and teacher of teachers. Uh, maybe I should, what can I bring to the table? Maybe I should just invite you to go online for half an hour and sit silent. But what I'd like to say is to offer some thoughts on a special play. And let me start saying why I think it's special. First of all, it's a play written by a Scottish woman. Now that may seem glaringly, even crassly obvious. But a point I have frequently made, as I have others like Carla Sassi, is that until 1980, women playwrights were not invisible in Scottish theatre, but very rare. Until around 1980, from 1900, the women playwrights one thinks of are three, Ina Lamont stewart Ada F. K., Joan Ewer, and working for the SCDA, Agnes Adam, who's often forgotten now. Ina um, was suppressed, frankly, by the patriarchal structures of Scottish theatre, uh, AFK was not very prolific, and John Ewer wrote very much for the professional fringe. So, although there were some strong Scottish managers like uh, C.D. Aiken of the Gateway Theatre and strong directors and fine dynamic, dynamic directors like Joan Knight at Perth, until the late, until the 70s, Scottish women were very much not to the fore of Scottish theatre. A shameful position, I have to say. Through the in the 1970s, we began to see a difference with Marcella Evaristi, but from 1980 on, there's an extraordinary flowering of which Anne-Marie de Mambro is an important part. And among her companions are people like Liz Lockhead, Sue Glover, Linda McLean, Nicola McCartney, Zinnia Harris, the list goes on. But these are five women playwrights who have now established international reputations. So Tally's Blood, written in 16... Uh, sorry, produced... <laughs> I'm going back to that early edition of the Mail. Um, Tally's Blood, produced in 1990, represents a significant element in a new wave of playwriting in Scottish theatre that celebrates the diversity of identity and the power of women writers. Secondly, it's special in that while it's not the first to address issues of new Scots, Unity Theatre's production of Robert Mitchell's The Gorbo Story, for example, includes an immigrant travelling salesman. But by and large, such earlier plays tend to represent such characters, if not as exotic, certainly as somehow outside the society, as outside characters. What Tally's blood achieves is to take for granted, as it should, the new, that the new Scottishness, almost before we use the term, of the Italians who came to make their lives in Scotland throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, often, as in this play, in the food industry. Thirdly, the play is for me a special achievement as an example of fine playwriting. And in the rest of this paper, I, I, as much as a fellow playwright as in the role of a scholar, try to explain why I have this reaction, seeing this as a special achievement. The play examines the experience of Italian Scots over a 20-year period. And excuse me reading from the text rather badly in front of so many expert teachers, but I'm going to try a close reading. Um, the play examines the experience of Italian Scots over a 20-year period uh, spanning the Second World War. And it does so, as Anne-Marie de Mambro herself explains in her introduction to the text, in a way that recognises that whatever pressure of prejudice there may be found in the host community, there's also prejudice to be found among the new Scots against the host community. What is more, and importantly, the play problematises the concept of what it is to be a Scot and so what it means to talk, if one can, in simple terms, of a host community. In Act 1, scene 13, we see the young characters Lucia and Huey parody a school class. Or perhaps this is not parody. Perhaps this is a painful reminder to us of how in the period the, the intolerance and prejudices they present might exist among <coughs> teachers as they dealt with their pupils. Notice how de Mambro has the Scottish Huey play here an Italian Scott Franco. 
he has become in some sense an incomer, while Lucia, the girl born in Italy, is the Scottish teacher. After putting Huey through a series of mental arithmetic questions until he falters, Lucia says, too long. I can't spend all day with one child. I've got those, these other little children to see to as well, you know, little Scottish boys and girls. I think they deserve some of the teacher's time too. You should have done these sums last night, Franco. Why didn't you? She goes on to taunt him with his way of life in a dialogue which includes the following. Sure you weren't too busy serving the shop. It's not Franco's fault he lives in a shop. Oh, so there's 12 of you living there. My, oh my, not all in the same bed, I hope. Now stop laughing, boys and girls, it's not funny. I don't know what you're doing in this class in the first place. A little ruffian like you, a sleek little, greasy little, smelly little. De Mambro conveys the prejudice shown towards some new Scots by mediating it through a child's game of teacher and pupil. But in that game, we may be reminded of the distinguished artist Richard DeMarco saying that he remembers having stones thrown, a, thrown him as, as a child in Edinburgh by other children just because he was Italian. Tally's blood. But de Mambro is not engaged in some simple blame game. She's clear that the fraught relationship is bilateral and indeed multilateral. Very early in Act 1, Scene 4, she has Rosinella, the heroine, if that's the word, say, what's it, the war coming on, to do with us. We just live here. It's not even our country. When war breaks out, she says, but it's got nothing to do with us, Massimo. We're Italian. We just live here. It's not our country. Later, when Italy has come into the war, Massimo says that that may have implications for them. She says, we just live here. We're just ordinary working people. While her husband, Massimo, born in Italy, feels part of the Scottish community, and his younger brother, Franco, born in Scotland, feels even more part of the community, Rosanella represents a part of the Italo-Scottish community that sees itself as apart, alien, and perhaps alienated from the community of which it forms part. Apart, but apart. Indeed, even the Italian identity of the kind Rosanella sees, as for her clearly determined, is complex in this play. At the end of Act 1, scene 2, set in 1939, when Franco and Massimo, the brothers, are celebrating their Italian community, they sing a song that begins, Giovanezza, Giovanezza, Primavera di Bellezza, Youth, Youth, Spring of Beauty. This is the chorus of a song that was, between the wars, an unofficial Italian national anthem. It became that because it was the marching song of the fascists and the Mussolini, whom the verses of the song praise. In this song is reflected the division between the power of Il Duce and the king, between the hierarchy of the party and the supposed constitutional settlement expressed in the national anthem, which this song for some replaced. So imbued is this song with its fascist meaning that it's still banned in Italy now. Yet it seems clear that neither Franco nor Massimo are fascists. Franco goes on to die fighting against the Axis powers. Community identity is complicated. That complication is increased when families and individuals seek to settle in new communities. Some assimilate, some don't, some do, but succumb from time to time to nostalgia. In Act 1, Scene 12, just before we learn that Italy has joined the war on Hitler's side, Massimo has a speech on which he remembers that, My father's got a house in Italy. There are no hot water, no kludgy, no lights, no gas. You have to walk two miles for water and cook in a big black pot on the fire. If you want a keek, you have to go outside. There's a hole in the ground with a plank across it and the flies buzz round your arse. God, I wish I was there now. <laughs> Massimo is quite different from his wife Rosanella, as we see. We're shown many varied varieties of response to settlement in a new environment. And this raises parallels with the position, now we learn from the most recent census, that there are more Polish speakers in Scotland than Gaelic speakers. And of course, Massimo's Scottish English has him using many Scots words, as he naturally uses Keith here. Throughout the play, de Mambro uses language to remind us of the assimilation process. And then towards the end of this paper, we see it work in reverse. In Act 1, Scene 4, when Lucia, having now started school, refuses to speak English, and Franco, Rosanella and Massimo are trying to persuade her she must. They mix up speak English with parla inglese. Lucia is obdurate until driven to distraction by the way she is, in effect, 
being torn between her own two linguistic identities, she screams at them, fuck off! <laughs> this violent release of tension draws out of the, re the reciprocal violence from Massimo's, slapping her using the Scots, you bloody bitch! And Rosanella in turn slapping him for hitting the wane. The ensuing verbal fight's volatility, a word used by de Mambro in a stage direction, marks the volatility, the mercurial shape-shifting of the play's exploration of identities, here reflected in language use. De Mambro's play, of course, shows us failure to communicate, not through language differences as such, but through constructions of self-identity which are based on community prejudice. Repeatedly, we're told by Rosanella, in particular, of the differences she sees between the Scots and the Italians. <coughs> Scottish girls are, in her mind, less self-respecting. When Rosanella sees Franco getting involved with Bridget, this Scott girl, she asserts it can own, be only because she must be giving you something you can't get from an Italian girl. She doesn't see, either can't see or refuses to see, that Bridget, Bridget's dull, no, let us go to the dance, and says, lassies just cheapen themselves at the dancing because their girls stand in a line in what is a kind of human market. Further, she's oblivious to the point that judging by their surname Devlin, Bridget's family is as much from the new Scottish community as hers, although larger and of longer standing, one with in general as strong a Catholic morality and tradition as her own. She's ensnared in a conception of family, honour and self-identification within a community that means that she, blinded by her own cultural preconceptions, cannot see the values embedded in the life of her neighbours. What is more, her traditional view derived from her early upbringing in Italy, that Italians should marry only Italians, is exposed in the play not only as narrow, but as actually emotionally crippling and potentially damaging to the future of those she loves most. Rosanella's determination that her brother-in-law, Franco, who, unlike her husband Massimo, as I said, was born in Scotland, should not become involved with Bridget, has brutal results. Franco, whose birth in Scotland makes me British, has a more relaxed attitude to intercommunity relationships. It is clear that he cares for Bridget deeply. We're told by Franco that in Italy, if you like someone, you buy them gold, and he has bought Bridget a gold charm, in the form, appropriately for someone who sells ice cream, of a cornet or a cornetto. We're reminded of the poverty of the times, we're in the 30s, remember, by Bridget's response. When told she can wear her charm on a chain, she reveals she doesn't have a chain or a bracelet or a watch. The daughter of a miner with a family of eight, whose mother clearly has no effective means of managing her fertility, she is too poor for such luxuries. The irony of Rosanella's proclamation of the essential virtue of Italian women lies not least in the fact that when her father wanted her to marry another man in order to increase the prosperity of her family back home in Italy, she and Massimo eloped. Under the conventions of the place and time, if they spent a night away with one another, however innocently, and surely innocence would be a relative concept if her idea of Italian virtue is so rigid, they had to marry. And still Rosanella sees the Scotch girls as easy of virtue. In fact, it is clear in the play that Franco and Bridget are committed to one another. It is only after he's joined up and is leaving for war that finally Bridget succumbs to him and is, as she resisted earlier, carried away. In scene nine in the gender store, where so much of the play has taken place, we see them in a post-coital embrace, during which Franco asks whether she regrets what she has done. And she, who has lost her father in a mine accident, says, Franco, listen to me. My mammy saw my daughter off to his work one morning, never saw him alive again. I'd regret it more if anything happened to you, and we hadn't. De Mambro deals with difficult issues of moral choice, the need of the young to grasp the moment, exacerbated, no doubt, by the fact of war and possible imminence of death. The moral complexity De Mambro explores is served by dramatic plotting of exceptional quality, full of ironies. We've noted the apparent impossibility of Bridget's mother being able to manage her fertility. It's a terrible irony that Bridget, in her apparent innocence of contraceptive practices, no doubt shared by Franco at the period in question, becomes pregnant by him. 
The difference between the rigidities of Rosanella and the tender empathy shown by her husband, Massimo, who because of that ability to empathise often seems weak, is that when Bridget comes to her f- comes t- for a loan from him as the only person she can think of to ask, he appears to understand why she would need one so urgently. Despite his religious beliefs, he gives her the money and she has a backstreet abortion. Rosanella, who is herself desperate for a child and envies Mrs Devlin, cannot come to terms with the pain of her own childlessness, seeing it in the narrow terms of her Italian prism, and me an Italian as well. Her rigid viewpoint brings her to make Bridget believe that Franco does not love her because she's Scottish and he can only love an Italian woman, and only used her for his own pleasure. This brings about Bridget's decision to lose her child, and later, when Franco's last letter arrives, it begin, and is addressed to, to Bridget and not to Rosanella, it begins, though very slowly, to dawn on Rosanella that there is a reality of emotion that lies beyond the strictly limited framework she believes applies in her family. She, who ran away for love herself, has not been able to see a love that grew in front of her eyes because that love did not fit into the prescribed, exclusive patterns of identity, sexual politics and cultural inward-lookingness that she sees as gospel. And yet there's no doubt that Rosanella, who has taken in a motherless child her, and come to love her, this is Lucia, love her possessively, no doubt, but truly, as her own, who is committed to the service of what she sees as her family. We are reminded more than once of her cutting the toenails of the elderly daddy of Massimo and, and Franco, has reserves of love to give, and yet she is blinkered. Anne-Marie de Mambro, in her introduction, calls it selfishness, which drives her prejudice. But I think de Mambro does not do justice to the richness of her own insight and creation. What Rosanella demonstrates is a woman trapped by her own viewpoints, which certainly lead to an expression of prejudice, but also are part of a constrained worldview derived from a restricted upbringing and a set of narrow principles. These she has never been able to question because to challenge them is in itself a sign of the wrongness of the worldview of those who would challenge her viewpoints. It would be a challenge and a threat to her own identity. She is in effect, for most of the play, cut off in a solipsist world. What is more, her prejudices are reinforced by her snobbery. She later talks of Huey, that's the brother of Bridget, as one of the Torags from the old Tun and later as a jumped-up wee piece of nothing who thinks because he works here, because he works in their shop, he can look at Lucia. While Anne-Marie de Mambro develops a central character in interaction with others, she is also, of course, drawing our attention to the wider world of wh- in which she lives. We've referred to the poverty of the Devlin family, and we see throughout Act One the hard, hard work of the ice cream shop, the heavy demands it makes on those who work all hours in it, sometimes emphasised, by the, something emphasised by the sardonic schoolroom scene which we heard earlier, in which the immigrants' hard work is derided. The Devlins come from the old tune, and while we may not know exactly where the old tune is, every town of any size has such an area, sure you have in your own towns, marked out by poverty and various kinds of social deprivation. The Mambro deftly sketches a sense of the nature of this district without overdoing the impression she conveys. She also brings into a dramatic picture larger issues, issues which at the time she wrote caused something of a surprise in a Scottish audience who had forgotten, or perhaps more accurately suppressed, the memory of what happened to the Italian community in Scotland during the war. In talking about this, I want to stand back a moment from the level of analysis of character, themes and plot with which I've been engaging and address some aspects of Anne-Marie de Mambro's dramaturgy a skillful deployment and exploitation of the craft of the playwright. There are technical problems for a playwright in handling the material she does. The time scale, for example, of the tale she wishes to unfold presents passages of time difficult to show on stage. Some commentators have talked of the play having a filmic structure, short scenes and often cross-cutting within scenes. Certainly that's fair comment, but what strikes me even more is the sheer effrontery of the skill, the gallusness by which she plays with the potential of the stage. There are, for example, two distinct time scales in the play. One, of course, runs from 1936 to 1944 in Act One, from Lucia's birth until Massimo's return from internment. 
In that time scale, we see the crises of upbringing that Lucia, her sister's who's died daughter, and quite soon Huey, go through, mor go through moral conflicts. I've already, discussed, um, I've already discussed these as they apply to Act 1. Act 2, however, covers in a matter of months, not eight years, a matter of months. And we still have the short scenes, but the playwright engages us in a much less leisured time scale. It's not that all is action, but that there is an acceleration of action until the final scenes take place almost breathlessly. Within this dramatic time frame, she's capable of a slight of a dramatic hand that, when we unpick what happens, can be seen to involve improbabilities, but in the theatre, because of her playwriting craft, carry us along. For example, no sooner has Bridget received the money from Massimo for her, for her abortion and left with a line to Massimo repeated several times earlier, everybody likes you, than within a page and in the same scene, we learn Italy is at war with Britain and we're engaged in a tightly drafted scene which conveys the terror of the local Italian community as the everybody that likes you, or a substantial part of that everybody, is attacking their shop, looting it, and calling them, among other insults, greasy tallies and tally bastards. Lucia, who at this point is about four years old, wets herself in fear, and within another page, the police, who Massimo and Ros Rosanella think will have come to apprehend the looters, come to take away Massimo and intern them. And in the next scene, we learn of the tragedy of the Arandora star. Yet this swiftness that of almost a thunderclap reflects the timing of the storm that broke over the Italian community. Mussolini brought Italy into the war in 10th June 1940, and the sinking of the Arandora star, with the death of literally hundreds upon hundreds of Italian internees, took place less than a month later, on, on the 2nd of July. A dramatic narrative that has been moving on the level of family drama, darkened somewhat by the threat and then the reality of war, suddenly reflects an agony felt as a national disaster, one which for many years after the war was hidden because the internment of Italian Scots was soon seen as shameful, shame made worse by the tragedy of the sinking of the Arundora Star. And here, one is dealing not just with issues of family, personality and community identities, but with the ways in which we as an audience may have our eyes opened to that from which the information channels of our society had for many years sought to avert them. In our introduction, the playwright talks of how little was, quotes, known about the experiences of Italians in this country during the war, end quotes. Her play opened these up again to our gaze. So having spent time talking about the Mambro's remarkable playwriting craft in handling the revelation of the dramatic material in Act One, let me address some of the ways in which Act 2 relates to and refracts the themes of Act 1. In Act 2, De Mambro brings her characters into the reality of life in Scotland and Italy in the mid-1950s in terms of cultural assumptions and particularly in terms of the place of women, as opposed to Rosanella's nostalgic perceptions of what Italian life means. In Act 1, she's scathing about what she claims is the easy sexual availability of the likes of this Scotch girl, the Bridget whom she insists on seeing as trying to entrap Franco, who should marry a good Italian woman. We now learn, she thinks, unsurprisingly, that the Chia should marry an Italian. She has lined up for her Silvio Palumbo, who can he keep his eyes off you. She recognises that many young Italian women have to work hard, cleaning chickens, for example, but quotes my Lucia's to marry a man that really loves her, not to put her in a shop and make her work. Further, her sense of the goodness of Italian men and the badness of Scotsmen, well-known fact, is, <laughs> is reinforced when she says, I don't know anybody works so hard as the Italian men. The stage direction that immediately follows this line reads, Huey in with pale and mop. In this theatrical jump cut from line to stage image, we see her willful neglect of what Huey has done for the family business. The disparagement of Scotsmen at the expense of idealised Italian men and how Rosanella has clearly over the years come to think of Lucia not as her sister's daughter and that of her widowed brother-in-law, but as my Lucia. And of her Lucia, she says, that's what I want for you, a good life with a good Italian man here. After the first scene of Act One, when we see the recently bereaved Luigi hand his daughter into Massimo's safe keeping, we've been allowed, or rather the playwright's craft has led us to forget that Lucia is being fostered by Rosanella and Massimo. Both have naturally formed 
a strong parental attachment, and clearly Lucia sees them as her parents, but they are not. We spoke earlier of the way in which Rosanella sometimes appears solipsistic in her attitudes. It may be harsh to say this of her attitudes to Lucia, but her emotional commitment, however understandable to her sister's daughter, has developed in such a way as to ignore the facts of the family relationships involved. Lucia is not hers, and she has no legal right to choose who might marry her, nor to wish her to live here in Scotland. So far as the Pedreski family, that's Massimo and uh, Rosanella, are concerned, this fact is the snake in the garden. When Luigi, as is his legal right, the, Lucia's actual father, demands that his daughter return to live with him, she must. Despite the emotional resistance that Rosanella in her extrovert and Massimo in his introvert ways put up in scene six, we see the parting take place in scene eight, halfway through act two. Now note the way in which de Mambro's dramaturgical gift craft is again at work. The second act pivots on this scene, which is more or less central in the act. 44 pages of script lead to it and 37 follow it. The crafting of the plot echoes some major examples, from the usual placing of the peripatia and anagnorisis in Greek tragedy to the placing in Hamlet of the revelatory mouse trap, exact, exactly halfway through the play and its action. Players are always working with structures of time as well as character and speech. By the time Lucia leaves for Italy, we know that she and Huey are in love though they have in a gently amused series of scenes never quite been able to express that to one another. Having faced the crisis of losing my Lucia, Rosanella in the next scene learns at last how strong she was, uh, how wrong she was about the love of Franco and Bridget and how her actions appear to have persuaded Bridget to abort the child she and Franco had made together. The Mambro never quite lets us know what Rosanella makes of this. The playwright leaves us to find our own understanding what she says in stage directions is, Ronanella, Rosanella backs off in disbelief on hearing that Bridget was pregnant with Franco's baby. She hears the story of the backstreet abortion with increasing horror. And when Bridget has finished, she is on her knees, blesses herself, lights down on her, but she stays there. Then we see Massimo and Huey at last come to a moment of understanding when Huey feels in the absence of Lucia and faced with Rosanella's constant hostility to his attachment to her, he must leave the shop. As Rosanella is dealing, though as far as we know, with no deep self-knowledge or a sense of her own responsibility with the loss of a possible nephew or niece because of Bridget's response to her goading, Massimo, whose empathy, empathy, empathy we have already described as appearing weak, faces her with her own self-centeredness. In a scene of enormous dramatic power, Massimo tells her, as we say in Scotland, her fortune, culminating in the lines, you love her that much, nobody else is to get love in her. Oh, aye, you love Lucia, all right. This is as much one might think as to say you don't truly love her at all, for her own sake. Lorizanella is shattered. Huey comes in upon the scene, and in three lines of powerful economy, there's a reconciliation between Rosanella and Huey in which they exchange names. She is first name Huey. She, her former married name, Mrs. Bedreski. And she ends the scene, Huey's son, I'm sorry. This is a word we have not so far heard her utter. She breaks down in tears and the toe rag from the old tune comforts her. At this point, we are five-sixths of the way through the play and the final six takes us to where in the mind of Rosanella and even at times, despite where he'd had the key, uh, that of Massimo, existed in an idealised way of life, Italy. Very quickly we learn that Lucia is very far from the kind of, quote, good life with a good Italian man Rosina wanted for, Rosanella wanted for her. She begins by being scared of a spider, which she thinks is a scorpion. This is for her an alien territory. The way of life is also alien. Luigi says to her, affectionately, my wife thinks you're lazy. I says she's not lazy, she's just no use to work. Later in this scene, Rosanella enters to see Ruth Lucia making a real mess of washing clothes in the country way using two stones. Rosanella releases her from this task. Suddenly, from being in the love story of Hugh and Lucia, the bad fairy, Rosanella is the fairy godmother. While Massimo's truth-telling has created an estrangement between the couple, it has brought her to see the value of Huey's integrity. She has brought him to be with Lucia. In another theatrical image of the different cultures Italy represents from those of Scots, Huey has got himself, of course, sunburnt. 
Despite this, having taken care of him, Rosanella takes him to meet Luigi, who meantime marks his patriarchal view of the world at the opening of Act 2, Scene 12, by sitting at a table and not lifting a finger to help, while Rosanella is required to move a glass from here to beside him. Here, Rosanella, in what can be seen as another example, uh, though this time to the audience's mind more sympathetic of her tendency to see things only through, through her own eyes, proposes to Luigi that Huey and Lucia marry. This is something which, as it dawns on Luigi, what is being proposed is for him simply ridiculous. His daughter is already engaged, although, as Lady Bracknell would think proper, she has not yet been told, <laughs> on the basis of property acquisition for her father. He gets property for her, who's his property. In this scene, Demambro makes protracted use of theatrical of the theatrical devices used already, for example, in Act Two, Scene One, of mixing Italian with a convention in, and English in a convention, whereby the audience understand that in a in context, Italian only would be spoken. This device is, of course, one used to enormous effect by Brian Friel for dialogue between monolingual Irish and English speakers in his extraordinary play Translations in 1980. And Demambro uses it to great effect here, theatrically. We're allowed insight into a clash of cultures from which, if original languages were used, we would be excluded. Luigi's rebuff engulfs Rosanella and her new friend Huey in despair. In a, in a line nicely expressing an Italian coming together, this time the Scot in Italian, Huey says, you mean that's it? Finito. Then, stunned but impressed by Huey's passion, Rosanella realises that the conventions that mean that when she spent the night with Massimo, they would have to marry, still apply. So she arranges for Lucia and Huey also to elope. An absolute outrage in her previous view of Huey. The final scene of the play comprises this elopement, one in which Rosanella, as in her own life, outrages the value she had spent much of the earlier part of the play praising at the expense of the cultural values, of, as, she saw, as she saw them, of her new home, Scotland. This scene marks another dimension of the Mambro stagecraft I have not had time to address, her ability to deliver her serious themes when appropriate with comedy, and it's a very funny play at times from time to time. In this case, there's a mix-up as Rosanella seeks to reenact her own elopement, which involved a ladder, in a way that is unnecessary. She even places the ladder at the wrong window. Lucia, <laughs> Lucia and Huey come out of the door while Rosanella is lost in Luigi's house up the ladder. As they leave, she is now where any mother might be on realising that to love your child, you must let her or him go, to live life with someone else. She had come to recognise something of the truth about her own selfishness and sought to expiate all the harm she had done by bringing together her foster daughter and the man she loves. Through this, she facilitates what she has spent most of the place striving to avoid, the merging of Italy and Scotland in a new generation. Yet in this act of loving, charity and selflessness, she actually achieves the selfish end she always wanted, to bind Lucia to living near her back in Scotland. The final image of the play involves reconciliation. Just as Act 1 ended with the return of Massimo after four years of internment, and I promise you it's a hard scene to read that scene without coming tears in your eyes at the end of it. So at the end of Act 1, there's a moving reunion. So Act 2 ends with the entry of Massimo again and a moving reunion. When Massimo returns to their hometown, he finds her at an upper window of the kind he and she eloped from all those years ago. The play ends with her descending the ladder into his arms and their reconciliation as fiesta fireworks explode. It might be a bit much as a coup de théâtre, but this play, which is so much about loss and reunion, ends as all good comedies should, with a coming together and a hope for a new life in which differences are resolved in mutual accommodation. Finally, we remember the title, Tally's Blood, refers to a nickname given to the raspberry syrup that topped ice cream cones sold by Italians, like Massimo and Rosanella. As Anne-Marie de Mambro says in her introduction, that prejudicial word, Tally, reflects the various racial or at least cultural prejudices in the play. She also points out that the blood of the title also relates to blood ties, family relationships, if you like, the tyranny of love. It also relates to bloodshed, the death of so many, Franco in battle, Daddy and so many others in the Arandora Star, and though not actual deaths, the living death for a time of Massimo's internment and the destruction of Franco's and Bridget's love. 
Yet in the end, the play is about renouncing old ties as one enters new relationships which become one's own. The fact an Italo Scott playwright and a woman could use this term as a title marks a process of reconciliation, not just of the characters in the play, but an integration into a new social reality, one of hybridity and hope for the future. <laughs>